Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 13th, 2010. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. For this week, home brewer Sean Terrell returns with a second take on his starter aeration experiment. He's got a stir plate now. Well, what did he find out using it? Also, we talk about Sean's yeast pitching rate experiment, where he distributed beers to dozens of home brewers to get their take on whether pitching rate significantly affects the character of a pale ale. Will his results mesh with what we found out in the BYO-BBR collaborative experiment? Stay tuned and find out. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter at Basic Brewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And you can find our show on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. And uh, you can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on the iTunes Store as well. We've got a lot of ground to cover this week. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, before we get into the interview, that I've put the dry hops into the fermenters for the BYO BBR Irish Moss Collaborative Experiment bottling just a few days away. I hope you're joining in too, and I can't wait to taste those beers. Lots of hops in my beer that I'm brewing up. Well, now let's get on to our chat with Sean Terrell. In his previous appearance on the show, Sean ruffled a few feathers when he uh, dissed the use of stir plates in making yeast starters. Well, since then, Sean has built his own stir plate and has uh, a follow-up on his experiment. Also, Sean weighs in with another experiment, testing pitching rates for homebrew and whether a panel of homebrewers can determine the difference in the final brews. Well, Sean Terrell, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Uh, thank you for having me back. It's good to be on again. Well, we've got two, uh, two things to cover. First off, we got some interesting reactions after the last time you were on the show uh, from your... Uh, yeast starter experiment in comparing. Uh, or, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and, and recap that briefly to kind of bring people up to speed? Well, interesting would be putting some of the reactions mildly. <laughs> uh, I, w- I wasn't expecting animosity. <laughs> but anyway, um, in a nutshell, what I did was uh, I did just a few small uh, two liter starters um, to test what effect different methods of aeration and agitation would have on the amount of yeast that they grew. Uh, you know, just doing a pretty simple uh, measuring the yeast slurry volume afterwards. Um, maybe you don't get perfect results like you would with doing a true cell count with a hemocytometer, but at least get order of magnitude differences. And uh, so what I sort of concluded from that was that uh, using an aquarium pump was to direct directly inject air was going to grow the most yeast, and agitating it, whether by just shaking or using a stir plate, uh, was going to grow slightly less. And where I got into trouble with that was that I made the assumption that shaking the starter as often as you possibly could would be roughly equivalent to a stir plate. And you... you... You were pretty vigorous in uh, in uh, shaking your starter. I mean, I think it was like uh, once every 15 minutes for several <laughs> hours or something like that. Uh, but it wasn't continuous. Right. It was not truly continuous. It was probably unreasonable for, for most home brewers. You know, if you have a, a you know, eight hour a day job and you want to sleep, you can't <laughs> shake it as often as I did. <laughs> Uh, I, I skipped both at one point, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was, I was swirling them up about every 15 minutes and really doing just really vigorous swirling. Um, 
And my thought would be that since that didn't allow the yeast to settle out in between, it just wasn't enough time for them to flocculate and start to settle at the bottom, that that would be roughly equivalent to a stir plate. And and we heard from the stir plate owners. Yes, uh, we did. Uh, <laughs> and let me just say, stir plates are really cool toys. And uh, now that I have one, I really enjoy playing with it. And I have nothing <laughs> against them. But uh, I wasn't sure that they, the expense was justified for someone who is just going to propagate yeast every few weeks or months. Now, when you say toys, you don't mean that in an offensive way, right? I mean... We we consider, you know, like I consider my brewing tools to be toys. I refer to them as toys. Right. Uh, I, I mean, toys in the most adult, manly, scientific sense possible. <laughs> I'm just trying to stem the tide of email again. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm about to throw the stir plate owners a bone, so hopefully we won't get any uh, any emails this time. So you broke down and you built a stir plate yourself. I did, uh, which was something that I had been planning to do for a long time and had just never gotten around to. Um, I did something similar to what you would see online. A lot of the forums and people, you know, homebrewers who have their own websites have posted, uh, you know, their procedures where you're just essentially using a computer case fan, you know, which is one of the cheapest possible sources for an electric motor. And using a couple magnets or sometimes people will pull a magnet out of an old hard drive and basically just by spinning that magnet you can get the magnetic field to rotate and turn a stir bar. And you did your test again with your uh, stir plate. That's right. Um, so I guess maybe I'll recap the results from last time. Um, we wound up with 88 millimeters or so I'm sorry milliliters of slurry from the swirled starter. And then using an aquarium pump and air stone, we got 116 milliliters, which is pretty substantially increased, about uh, 32%. And then this most recent trial using the stir plate was 100 milliliters. Ah. So it's intermediate between the two, but is a pretty significant increase over the, uh, the shaken starter, about uh, 14%. So the... Uh using the real life uh real life stir plate and not the uh shaken every few minutes equivalent uh you did see a an improvement but yes but not as much as the aquarium pump right and not quite as much as uh for example the Mr. Multi calculator Jamil Zanishev's pitching rate calculator would suggest although it's really close uh that calculator you know within the error that homebrewers would probably consider acceptable is spot on. So we have some vindication for the stir plate owners. Yes, absolutely. And this Although is I have to say, you know, and this is based only on three, uh, three starters, that the aquarium pump is still the best option if you have to pick one or the other. So this, I mean, this is, uh, this is all, this is how real science works, right? I mean, you, you do an experiment and you put it out there for your peers to evaluate and comment on, and hopefully it doesn't come out like cold fusion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I graduated from Purdue, so there's a bit of a sore spot. That, uh... <laughs> that was accidental, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But uh, but you get yeah, oh that wasn't a uh, a Purdue nuclear engineering department joke. <laughs> I'm not that smart. <laughs> but you 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 put your science out there and you get comments and feedback from members of the community and then you go back again and you and you do the experiment again and see if you get different results. Right. It's uh, it's peer review and these are my online peers who are reviewing the results and making suggestions. And it turns out I'm very glad they did because otherwise I wouldn't have – I would have moved forward in an erroneous assumption. Well, there you go. Sometimes it's good to be wrong. Eh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> so uh, so we, I think – anything else that you want to say about that uh, before we – I must compliment you on your, on your uh, uh, intestinal fortitude uh, and your, uh, your honesty – 
an integrity of uh, uh, doing the redoing the experiment or continuing the experiment and then coming out with, uh, you know, risking looking uh, like you have ag on your face. So kudos to you, Sean. Uh, well, thank you. I uh, Hopefully I won't get any more nasty emails now. Uh, <laughs> no, the, the vast majority were very polite and, you know, this is – something you might not have considered and it would be really good if you would look at this specifically. Uh, I did have one guy tell me that he thought I probably made bad beer. That stung a little. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) you know, the ultimate insult. Ouch. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, the anonymity uh, of the internet. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I get some of that stuff every now and then, you know, people say things to you online that they would never say to you in person. It's kind of like road rage, only uh, on the Internet. Anyway, well, let's move on to other things then. Uh, And, you know, I always welcome feedback on this show, uh, and I accept it in in a uh, a positive, constructive way, unless you're just nasty, and then I I tend not to. Uh, uh, Just... (laughs) To weigh that. But, Delete. There's no uh, yeah. no reason to get your feathers ruffled. There you go. But you've got – we're here to talk about a, another experiment that you conducted. Uh, and this was – was it inspired by our uh, Brew Your Own Magazine uh, collaborative uh, experiment on yeast pitching rates? Yeah, it absolutely was. Um, the You know, the motivation is really the same as, as yours or at least what I would interpret yours to be, you and Chris Colby. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of rumor and hearsay and just sort of uh, old wives' tales in in brewing and homebrewing in particular. And uh, at, at least at the homebrew level, a lot of these things never get critically evaluated. And so, uh, you know, every everyone really was was really hoping for conclusive results out of your, uh, your collaboration. And... Uh, I guess I just felt like it didn't quite get there. No, we we got we got results all over the board. I mean, some people said, you know, it, it it seemed to me that it depended on the style of beer sometimes whether there was a dramatic result or not uh and whether people, you know, preferred the beers that were either underpitched or overpitched or properly pitched. Uh so, what did you decide to do to follow up Essentially, what we wanted to do was, and I say we out of habit, <laughs> from you know writing academic literature, we the investigative team. Uh, <laughs> it's me in my garage. <laughs> the the royal we. Exactly. Uh, what I wanted to do was essentially do the same experiment. Uh, have a beer that was pitched at the standard rate and one that was underpitched, and it's actually a split batch. So the beers are ident- as identical as it's possible to make them. Um, but then get a large, you know, statistically valid number of tasters to try both beers and give feedback. Uh, and so the way I did that was using the remarkable tool that is the Internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, on one of the forums, uh, put out a, a post and said, hey, you know, I would really like to conduct this experiment would people be willing to reimburse me for the shipping costs if I sent you the beers? And what did they say? Overwhelmingly, yes. Uh, you know, I was I was uh, brewing about a six six and a half gallon batch, and so I wanted to get about twenty sets of samples out there, and had sort of anticipated maybe that it would take a while, and you know, I'd have time to put a recipe together, and I got twenty yeses in less than twenty four hours. Wow. Yeah, it was really just a, a remarkable response and I think sort of does speak to that desire for good data on these things that we just don't have in a lot of cases. And one of the yeses was from me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you, you sent me beers. But uh, mm-hmm. talk talk about the beer that you brewed, uh, the variation, and then the structure of the experiment. Okay, yeah. Uh, I guess for starters, I'll uh, I'll run down the recipe just so that people can kind of you know, people who didn't get to taste the beers can sort of know what they would expect from it. Um, let me open my basic brewing logbook, <laughs> which, which I've been using for my last few batches, and I love it, by the way. Thank you. Uh, okay. 
Uh, six and a half gallon batch. It was seventy-seven uh, percent two row, fifteen uh, percent pale Munich, six percent crystal forty, two percent crystal eighty. Um, Magnum for bittering, twenty grams, uh, which is oh god, I forgot to do my conversions before I came on again. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. It's about, that's about seven tenths of an ounce. Uh, and then uh, 10 grams each of Centennial and Willamette at 15 minutes, 10 grams each at Flameout. And then the yeast I chose was uh, Y-East 1272, which is, they call it American Ale 2. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with 1056, uh, the Chico strain from Sierra Nevada. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a great yeast, but it's really clean. And in my experience, at least, it's really clean no matter what you do with it. Which makes it a great option if that's what you're going for, but might not lend itself to comparing the yeast flavor, you know, side by side. Right. So 1272 is a little fruitier. Uh, some people describe it as nutty. Um, and it's also a great flocculator. And since I was going to bottle these, that was something I knew I wanted. What we wound up with was sort of a uh, middle of the road, uh, pale side, a little bit less hoppy side of an American Amber. And how did you structure the experiment? What I did was after, at the end of the brew day, uh, after chilling, I uh, I ran the wort into two fermenters, which were just the plastic bucket fermenters. Uh, wound up with a hair over three gallons in each. And then prior to brew day, I had built up two different uh, yeast pitches, one of which was... Essentially, what I did was I made a starter, and then I split it into a large starter and a small starter. So one yeast wound up, or uh, one fermenter wound up being pitched at about 0.7 uh, billion cells per liter degree Plato, which is you know the standard quoted ale pitching rate, and the other was pitched at about 0.3 billion per liter degree Plato, so about 40 percent of the standard rate which is roughly what you would get if you took a, uh, a reasonably fresh smack pack or vial of yeast and just threw it directly in a five-gallon batch. What did you see over the fermentation? Got some really interesting results from the fermentation. Um, I checked it with a refractometer uh, every 24 hours. Um, and visually, at 24 hours, the standard pitching rate was already at high croissant. And the, uh, the underpitched beer was fermenting steadily, but hadn't quite gotten there yet. Uh, you know, it was foaming, but it wasn't in danger of, you know, billowing out the top of the fermenter or anything. Uh, they reached the same final gravity. One of the things you hear as, a, uh, as an argument for pitching more yeast is that you'll get better attenuation. Uh, these both attenuated down the same, but the standard beer reached full attenuation after 72 hours, and the underpitched beer took 144 hours. Hmm. So it was roughly twice as fast. So, so far, uh, your results sound similar to what uh, I experienced with my experiment. Uh, the times were different, but the end gravity, I mean, I didn't take gravity readings during fermentation like you did, uh, but the final gravities ended up uh, pretty much the same with mine mm-hmm. as well. So pretty much, so we're on the same page so far. Right. And I guess one caveat to say is that this was not technically a true test of throwing a smack pack directly in versus making a starter because these were both pitched from starters. Mm-hmm. So one advantage of making a starter is that you do get a larger yeast population, but also you're going to have more active yeast. Uh, so uh, I guess it is possible that you would see better attenuation with active yeast versus pitching a yeast that had been dormant for a few weeks or months. Uh, that just wasn't something I was able to test with this setup. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's good to to check just one variable at a time when you're doing an experiment. So, um, right. So how did you uh, uh, how did you do the the evaluation with the human element? So what I did was uh, ended up sending out 17 sets of samples, uh, which were three bottles each. 
So everyone got either two controls and one underpitched beer, or vice versa, one control and two underpitched beers. Um, and they were labeled just ABC. So that's what's called a, a blind triangle test. So Steve and I uh, got the beers, and on a day that we were shooting at Steve's house for a basic brewing video, we sat down and evaluated the beers, and you gave us a, a standard form. Uh, um, and talk about the form that you gave us. Yeah, what I wanted to do was sort of, you know, guide people in their responses so that, you know, I didn't want people just scribbling down on blank paper. Um, initially, I thought, well, I'll just send out the BJCP score sheet, um, which, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with. But since we weren't looking at people who are necessarily beer judges, maybe they wouldn't have filled it out before. And also, it's just a huge form. There's a lot of stuff on it. And if, you know, you figure you're filling out three of them, it would probably take people at least half an hour to just to get through them. Yeah. Uh, so I asked essentially, you know, broke things down into essentially the same categories with appearance, aroma, flavor, mouthfeel, overall impressions. Uh, but just put, you know, made a three column form uh, so that, the, you know, people could write their results for each of the beers on the same sheet. So Steve and I took the test. Uh, we sat down and we recorded the results. And before we went into it, Steve uh, uh, Steve predicted that we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So uh, have a listen to what we said. So how do we want to do this? Uh, why, don't, why don't I start with the first category, which is foam appearance. Okay. And then uh, you will take turns going down the line here. Sounds great. All right. Foam appearance. I didn't see much. I didn't see much difference between the three. How about you? I didn't either. I thought maybe C had better uh, foam retention and appearance, but you poured C last. But when I um, went back and swirled them up a little bit, they all kind of developed the same amount of head, and so I really couldn't. I would have to say that it's a draw. Now C had more hiss when I opened the bottle. It definitely did. It definitely had the most pressure in it. Yeah. But that could also be because of uh, headspace. You know, if you have if you have a different headspace in the bottle itself, if you have less, or I should say more headspace, you'll develop higher pressure. Well, I forgot to check the headspace beforehand. I'm assuming they were the same. Right. Yeah. But there you go. Okay, so you go first on beer appearance. Um, all three of these beers, uh, again, Again, it, it, it kind of goes back to my prediction. I think that they are very close together. If I had to choose, I would say B was a little darker. Um, that may just be my lighting. I don't know, but that's that's what my eyes see. Um, I don't have, have an SRM guide handy, so I can't comment on that. Uh, I think that they're all moderately hazy. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not thick hazy. They're not like right. you know San Francisco at 8 a.m., <laughs> but, uh, but definitely there's some haze in there. Uh, but not an unattractive. It's an attractive beer and kind of what, you know, you expect to see from an unfiltered pale ale. And I said there were, it was, I wrote down copper color, slight haze. And I didn't, I didn't detect a difference between any of them. They all, they all look the same to me, color, well, color appearance wise. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really and truly splitting hairs. And again, it might just be the angle at which I'm looking at these beers. So, Yeah. And I don't think we even know what style of beer this is. We're just tasting this beer. It seems like to me like it's a pale ale. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be just a standard pale ale. Um, it's not a lager. No. And uh, the color and the hop rate, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's certainly not a heavy Weizen gone bad. No. <laughs> you know, it's definitely a pale ale, you know, and uh, I don't get a lot of. Um, Oh, kind of uh, like carrot pills or anything like that in there. It just seems to be a pretty standard, you know, beer. Okay. For aroma, I think it's my turn to go first, right? Yeah. I said uh, A had a slightly cider aroma. I'm just writing, saying what I wrote down. Uh, B, I said initially malty, perhaps a slight cider note. And then C, I said no cider and no, I didn't get much of an aroma out of C at all. In fact, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of aroma from, I didn't get a whole, maybe it's just the allergy season, but uh, I thought to me, uh, 
there was a slight, very slight cider note in A and B that I didn't detect in C. But the, as I tasted, as I went along, I didn't detect that cider note much at all in any of them. So I'm not sure if it's just because it was coming off the initial head or what. Yeah. Um, I interpreted that note as just fruit. I, I, but, but once you said cider, I went, oh, yeah, okay, that's a little little green apple. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I first interpreted that as a banana flavor. Huh. To my to my palate or my nose actually, um, so but I felt like whether whether those notes are some are, would be a technical flaw or not I don't know, but I do know that I thought it was pleasant, whatever it was, uh, so it was just fruity, a lot of esters, uh, not real strong and certainly not a big hop thing. It, it, it was, uh, and I get I get some malt you know when I smell them. But once again, I'm back to my prediction. There, to me, there was virtually no difference between the beers. And now that they've warmed and have been sitting out on the counter, and I have swirled them up now while you were talking a couple of times, uh, I'm not getting that. So maybe it was just when they were first opened, and maybe you know the, the third one dissipated before I got to it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But again, very, very, very slight difference at all. Um, okay. Flavor, you go first. Um, I I would describe these as uh, malty and creamy. Mm. The these beers are not about hops. The hops is, are restrained and in the background, though there is enough hops to um, balance against the the creaminess and the maltiness of the beer. Um, again, the esters pretty much dissipated. I I, I agree with that. Um, they're not terribly alcoholic beers, but I do get a little bit of warmth from them. So I don't know. It's probably a 5% beer, I would think, 45 to 5.5% beer. Um, definitely some fruit, but not huge. Uh, this is a beer that's probably meant to be pretty pretty much down the middle. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, there's nothing that's out. There's nothing that's just hitting you over the head, like a bunch of raisins or a bunch of uh, hops or or a huge malt, you know, sweet, malty kind of thing. But for me, the characteristic that I find most about it is still its creaminess and its maltiness. Did you find a difference between any of them? No. Okay. I I said that A and B uh, were malty with little hop character, Mm -hmm. and that C was perhaps a little more bright, which could have been because of a additional carbonation might have been a little more bright on the tongue maybe accentuated the bitterness just a little bit more uh but again a minute difference if at all well and i would uh say that for me i think that you're right except i would pull it further and say that uh c and a have the exact same mouthfeel and taste to me Hmm. b when i first tasted it so I, what I said earlier, I'm not talking on both sides of my mouth. After I'd thought about it for a while and tasted them over time, I decided they didn't taste any different. But when I first tasted them, B seemed to be the different beer taste-wise to me, and A and C seemed to have the equal brightness, equal mouthfeel. Right. But, it, but I'm like you. The, the differences are so slight, I don't know if I'm suggesting that to myself or if it's really there. Okay, mouthfeel. Let's see. Whose turn is it? Is it mine first? Uh, Mouthfeel. I said a moderate body, uh, no lingering sweetness. Uh, But again, and maybe it was the poor, maybe, you know, but I thought B or C was a little cleaner, a little more bright in the mouthfeel, perhaps because of additional carbonation. Uh, And I'm sure that that's dissipated now sitting on the table. So did you... What did you think about the mouthfeel, and did you, did you perceive any difference? Uh, well, again, I did perceive a little bit of difference. I thought B had the most body when I first tasted it. I thought A and C um, were the exact same beer. I, I can't tell any difference between those two beers. I, I just, from my very first initial taste, I, I would predict that B is the odd duck, and I guess I still hold with that. But I'm hearing you saying that you that I'm hearing more that C is your odd duck. I'm thinking so. Okay. But again, 
it's almost a coin toss. It's tough. Th- these beers are are so so close together, and yeah, there's very little difference between these three beers. Okay, so identify which do you think are the standard and which was underpitched. I think A and C were underpitched, and and B is the full pitch. Or I think <laughs> B is underpitched, and A and C were were fully pitched. Meaning that there is some, I did note some difference between those two groupings. But I don't know enough about this to know what underpitching would do Mm. or overpitching or proper pitching would do. So, again, to my mouth and nose, B is a different beer. Mm. But I'm not skilled enough to say why it's different in terms of under pitching or proper pitching. Well, I said that A and B were under pitched and C was the standard pitching, mainly because I detected the, those very, very slight cider notes on A and B in the very beginning, mm-hmm. and that C had the different level of carbonation. Mm-hmm. So I was. In my mind, I'm thinking if if it has enough healthy yeast, you know, if the yeast is stressed, it may give off some additional fruity notes. And if there's enough on the on the flip side, if there's enough healthy yeast in the beer, then it would have a higher carbonation level because they they would be better able to do bottle conditioning. Yeah, um, I may be. I may just be full of hooey. Well, no, I. You know, and that's the interesting thing about an experiment like this uh, is that I think I think that what I can take away from it at the moment is that um, all three of these beers are very drinkable beers. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of them are flawed in a way that you would say, "Ooh, what did you make that?" or "That's interesting." They're they're good beers. I I agree that, but again, we we differ on which beer is different. To to me, B is a little different. I think it. I think that it initially had a little more astringency, a little more body, mm. um, and I wanted to say it was a little darker. If that's due to due to a difference in the yeast pitching rate, I can't say for sure because it's so so close together. Mm. But the exercise is to pick the one that's different. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve, for thank- playing along. Thanks, James. This was a lot of fun. As usual, I'll probably have my you-know-what hanging out when, they, <laughs> <laughs> when, when the results come in, but um, at least I'm willing to take a risk. There you go. Okay, we're back. Uh, so, But I was surprised at how similar the three samples were. I mean, it was really, really hard, and you could, you could hear Steve and me debating back and forth uh, but we d- we might have influenced each other a little bit, but we didn't convince each other, you know, either overtly or uh, subconsciously to change our minds. So Steve picked B as being the different beer, and I picked C as being the different beer. So what was the result? Well, you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> you not only not only differentiated them correctly, but identified the beers correctly as far as which was standard and which were underpitched. I'm I'm amazed by that. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> was... Well, and it's it's interesting that you mentioned how similar they were. Uh, when I tasted them, they were extremely young. Um, they'd only been in the bottle about two weeks, and the differences I thought were pretty dramatic. Huh. And it seems to point to age being an important factor. Um, the first half of the respondents to the experiment, roughly, about half of them differentiated the beer correctly. Huh. Whereas in the second half, fewer than a quarter um, were able to tell the difference. That's interesting. So unfortunately, I didn't structure the experiment in advance, you know, anticipating that being an important variable. So I didn't have people note the date they were tasting and if someone were to do something like this in the future i would definitely recommend uh controlling that variable yeah so bottle conditioning may be a factor 
Yeah, you know, you have the yeast sitting there on the bottom, uh, especially if you're storing it at room temperature. Things like esters are going to get reduced back into some of the higher alcohols. Uh, yeast metabolism is incredibly complex. There are literally over a thousand different uh, flavor active compounds that yeast play with in the wort. And a lot of those reactions keep happening to a certain extent after fermentation's over. So I got it right. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> well, mention that several more times. <laughs> you know, you got to take your victories when you when you get them. If you're me, uh, so how did everybody else do? Well, overall, uh, we had 37 uh, individual tasters, um, 30 of whom uh, made an attempt to differentiate the beers. Uh, so what I asked was essentially just what are these three beers? Tell me which ones are standard pitched and which ones are under pitched. And so just asking that one question actually gives us two results. Number one, you can tell how many people were able to tell the difference. And number two, you find out how many of those can identify which beers which. So just if the beers were literally identical, if it was just a, a random chance of guessing correctly, you would expect about one in three to differentiate the beers and half of those are one in six to identify the beers. Mm -hmm. So out of the 30 people who, who tried to do that, uh, we would expect 10 to guess correctly and five to get the identities of the beers right. What we actually had was 13 uh, tasters or about 43% who differentiated the beers and nine tasters, uh, or uh, thirty percent, who were able to identify them. Huh. So, what do we take from that? Well, on the surface, that may not sound like a lot. You know, you say, "Well, three extra people uh, differentiated the samples." But if you look, if you look at a binomial distribution, which is what this is, you know, the results are binary. You're either right or you're wrong. Uh, the probability that a random group. 13 or more would get it right is only about 17%. So from a purely statistical standpoint, we can say with 83% confidence that the beers do taste different. Hmm. So then, but if you look at the 13 people who did differentiate correctly, uh, nine of those got it right. They picked, yourself included, they picked... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> which one was underpitched and which were standard? Uh, the probability of that happening is about the same. It's about 13%. So whatever the tasters who got it right were keying in on, they knew to a certain extent what to look for. Uh, so, you know, the, thing, the litany of things that we hear why underpitching is bad, you know, more esters, higher alcohols, you know, hot solventy alcohol character, diacetyl acid aldehyde, all those sorts of things, you know, off flavors. Um, where even if the beers tasted different, but they were equally good, you would expect to see a 50-50 distribution. And the fact that we didn't suggest to me at least that at least some of those off flavors are present from underpitching. So can you get some, some clues from the most common descriptors that people used about these beers? Absolutely. Um, and this is where the experiment sort of becomes less mathematical, I suppose, would be the best way to put it. Uh, because, you know, inherently you're asking people to describe something. They aren't all going to use the same words. They aren't all going to think that certain words even mean the same thing necessarily. But we did see some really dramatic differences in some of those words. Um, for example, bitter. 26% uh, of people called the standard beer bitter but 54% called the underpitched beer bitter. Hmm. So over twice as many. And I should point out when I'm saying these, these percentages are weighted for the number of samples. Since more people tasted the control beer, then there were more bottles of the control beer tasted than there were bottles of the underpitched beer. Uh, just because people tasted in groups and some groups had more people than others. Uh -huh. Uh, some other things that had pretty substantial differences, uh, astringency. Uh, only 9% noted astringency for the control, 
but 29% said that the underpitch beer was astringent. And it's pretty much the same story for solventy or fusel or hot, words like that. Uh, 11% for the control and 25% for the underpitch. So did you get more uh, descript- off-flavor descriptors for the underpitched beer uh, of those that were results that were returned early on? Does that make well, sense? Well, uh, again, I didn't actually record the data for the dates. So I'm just sort of working from my memory. Um, but yes, I believe we did. So maybe that maybe again the uh, the off flavors were more present in the younger beers than they were later on. Mm-hmm. And and like I said, when you have active yeast in there, they're going to continue to metabolize some of those things. Um, so you know that that maybe isn't as much of an issue at a homebrew scale, where leaving something sit in a bottle for a month or two is not a huge concern. Uh, but certainly that's why professional brewers are worried about pitching rates because that is, you know, an enormous lost revenue stream to have something that they have to age out of right, the beer. Right, right. Uh, and, and contrary to the, to the, to the mean guy, the mean uh, stir plate guy, these weren't bad beers, either one. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, for the most, for most of the tasters, this is the only beer of mine that they have tried or maybe will ever try and unfortunately it wasn't a great you know supremely drinkable beer just because it was sort of bland by design right it wasn't the most exciting beer right but it wasn't nasty so (laughs) yeah i'm not saying you know it wasn't contaminated or anything it's just uh not something that i would uh i would brew for you know for pleasure (laughs) Although so, brewing is always pleasurable. There you go. So so what do we ta- – I mean, the if I were to read the results, uh, having not tasted the beers uh, myself, I would perceive them as being more dramatic than I think the differences actually were. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So if um, – I mean, I think that I still think the difference between the beers was very minute. I mean, you heard Steve and me struggling to find the differences in our samples, and right. it was tough. I mean, and Steve's got a good palate, and he he didn't catch it. Uh, well, just I'm, just not as good as yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We keep much. plugging that one. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, one danger is I set, my, set myself up as, some, as somebody, you know, a super taster, and then the next time I'll oh, fail Oh, God, you're going to start miserably. getting bottles of beer. That are, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, well, people are going to challenge you. Yeah, I'm flying too close to the sun. Uh, so, but I think that uh, maybe what we can say is that if you are, say, entering beers to a contest – or uh, trying to brew a style spot on that, uh, you know, pitching the right amount of yeast is an important thing to do. Yeah, I would absolutely say that, especially for competition. Uh, You know, if there's even a chance that, you know, for the most part in a competition, you're only going to have two people tasting your beer. And if it turns out that even one of them is a person who's perceptive or maybe just predisposed to taste these differences, uh, that could really hurt your beer. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, w- one thing that we that I forgot to touch on is overall, there's actually no strong preference one way or the other. Ah. About fifty five percent of the tasters preferred the the standard rate, and forty five percent preferred the underpitch beer. Huh. So it's really it may just be a question of your personal preference, uh, which one you like better. Yeah, that again, that that kind of uh, echoes what we found out in our uh, collaborative experiment. Um, I was I was amazed at the end of that experiment that you know the underpitched beers weren't universally nasty, uh, or the overpitched beers weren't universally too clean, or you know all those things that we hear about pitching rates um, weren't obvious in the samples that people tasted right and well i should point out that uh the the people who differentiated the beers uh 
overwhelmingly preferred the the, the standard pitching rate. Ah. Uh, more than two to one. Well, interesting. Uh... But, uh, yeah, I mean, if nothing else, I think the takeaway here is that pitching rate is going to have an impact on the flavor. Um, you know, whether a higher rate or a lower rate is something you want in a particular beer might change from one batch to another, but it's, it's something that you need to think about as a component of the flavor the same way you would, you know, adjust the hopping rate or your mash temperature. Right. Some styles may benefit from, uh, say, we were talking with uh, Peter Hoey about uh, uh, Vodanada Beer Brewing Company about uh, some of the beers that he brews. He stresses out the yeast on purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's. I think that's relatively common for uh, for a lot of Belgian styles and uh, things like Hefeweizen. Uh, that under pitching will get you that ester profile that you're really looking for. Well, very good. Anything else that we haven't that we've missed on either of these two things? Oh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sitting here uh, and I'm reading through my own, you know, write up of this experiment, uh, but it's fairly lengthy and I probably glossed over something. Well, and I'll I'll put links to uh both uh this experiment and your page on your uh your stir plate, uh which is an interesting design by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, for people who don't know what we're laughing at, it's uh, a probably a decade old uh, Rubbermaid kitchen container <laughs> <laughs> turned upside down is my stir plate. <laughs> but you know it works. It, That's right. It's it, the uh, it's the engineer's credo. If it's stupid but it works, it isn't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. So, so do you have an idea on, on, on another experiment, or are, you, or are you done? Well, what I'm doing now, I uh, actually have a starter going right now, is I've found that uh, running the stir plate with the aeration stone in it uh-huh. uh, knocks down enough of the foam that you can actually run the aquarium pump 24-7. Wow. So I will probably do one more, uh, one more trial just to see if that actually grows any more yeast. Well, we'll look forward to those results and the tongue lashings <laughs> yeah, that will follow. <laughs> well, it's really, really interesting because with that pump, uh, a two liter starter grew up about what you would look at for pitching five gallons of lager. I mean, it's a lot of yeast. Wow. Well, cool. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to those, those results and, uh, and hopefully we can get back together. Absolutely. I appreciate your time and effort once again, Sean. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's, uh, it's really good to be able to share with people like this. Well, thanks again to Sean. As I said in the interview, that takes some courage to step up and say that uh, he didn't have things right on predicting the effect of a real-life stir plate. I mean, he could have he done his stir plate experiment with his stir plate and just said, huh, look at that, and not told anybody, but... <laughs> <laughs> but he stepped up, and that, I think that adds to his uh, credibility. And uh, the results of his pitching rate experiment are very interesting to read. He goes into detail and has charts and graphs and all that. Uh, and I'll put uh, links to Sean's work in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. And we look forward to the next results from Sean. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Just a handful of our brewers' log, work, log books or log books are st- still available out there. Uh, we've also got our Ryan Heights Kavod as a four letter word shirt in our shop as well. And our DVDs are on our website too Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. Stepping into all grain, low tech lagering and decoction mashing, and introduction to wine kits. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them from us in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. 
Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are USB Gender Changer, a female to female. Well, that doesn't sound like a change at all. And Dalen HY or HSY 100, three quarter inch by 100 foot holographic bird scare tape to scare those holographic birds out of your garden, I'm assuming. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we appreciate your support. Wish they had holographic Japanese beetle scare tape. Don't forget, you can (laughs) join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through our links as well. That's it. That's all. Until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson in Austin, Texas. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.